It was sometime in the late 1960s, while I was a student at Boston University, that a roommate of mine, we were seven all told, domiciled in a cramped apartment on Kenmore Square, invited me to his home in Belfast, Maine, to spend Easter vacation. With no formative plans for the forthcoming break, I readily accepted. Even so, the invitation puzzled me. Though we shared an apartment, Howard Gross and I were not particularly intimate. With half a dozen roommates to choose from, why did Howard single out me? Many decades later, I think I know the answer. Not a particularly flattering one, I fear. Like Howard, I was a loner. One might even go so far to say a loser. A kindred spirit with whom he could identify to whom he could safely confide his terrible secret. We left Boston in Howard's aging but serviceable sedan early Friday afternoon and, taking turns at the wheel, enjoyed a leisurely drive along the still largely rural New England coastline. Shortly after nightfall, Howard pulled off Route 1 in Belfast onto the first of a nexus of unpaved roads that twisted through a forest of old growth conifers to a remote bluff on an even remoter inlet of Penobscot Bay. When abruptly he swung off the road onto a circular drive, I thought at first he'd missed his turn and was reversing direction. So occluded by night was the darkened house that loomed in the shadows. A hulking mass three stories tall, gross mansion teetered at the edge of a strip of rock-bound coast as if dropped there by a colossal but unsteady hand. Judging by the fanciful Greek columns, the sole features of the edifice readily discernible in the pervading gloom. The house dated from the federal period. Clumps of unkempt shrubbery shrouded the driveway, providing scant protection against the sharp ocean breeze. As we removed our bags from the trunk, I glanced up at the moonlit facade. Struck by the massive dwelling's solitary and forbidding aspect, I remarked, Looks like everyone's gone to bed. I live alone, Howard said. Yeah, sure. I grinned at what I imagined to be a joke. But then, there was something about the windswept grounds, the unkempt shrubbery, the tall sweeping grass, the crippled trees bent nearly double, from repeated blasts from the sea that quickly erased my grin. Not even a caretaker, I asked, when having ushered me through a pair of imperial oak doors and down a long, dimly lit hallway into the library. Howard set about igniting a stack of logs in an Italianate marble fireplace, whose ornateness typified the room's furnishings. I hire someone from town who occasionally looks after the grounds and sees to it that the road is plowed in winter. Otherwise, I fend for myself. I never suspected you were rich. <laughs> Howard dismissed my comment with a derisive grunt. Then, feeling perhaps that, as his guest, I was due an explanation. The truth is, I have all I can do to scrape up enough cash to keep the place going. I have no fear, though, he added with forced jocularity. We'll eat well. I don't know about you, but I'm starved. And to his credit, Howard whipped up an impressive meal. Steak broiled in a savory sauce with baked potatoes and a variety of vegetables. Afterwards, in the high-ceilinged oak-paneled library by the crackling fire, he told me something about himself and his extraordinary family. My parents are dead, he explained. I'm quite the orphan. In fact, I'd like to show you their graves. Not now, of course, but perhaps in a day or two. Well, of course not now, I remember thinking. It's well after midnight. Not the time to be traipsing about the countryside like a pair of ghouls seeking out tombstones. You see... I didn't fully comprehend, had no idea the horror. 
As it turned out, Howard's parents were buried right there in the house. In the basement. And if you're thinking that Howard had anything to do with their deaths, you're quite wrong. I wish it were that kind of story. A simple tale of parasite. Such a tale would be far less terrible, far easier for me to bear the knowledge of in my waking and sleeping hours than the actual truth. There's something I ought to tell you about the grosses, Howard said a bit later, after coffee and cigars. We're not like other families, not exactly, that is. You look normal enough, I said, half-jokingly. What was he leading up to? Why had he brought me to this remote mansion by the sea? You're not a family of vampires, I hope. Howard smiled weakly. Look, I know it's an imposition to subject you like this to my family history, but humor me. I implore. I've reached the stage at which, if I don't confide in someone, I'll go mad. And I'm not being melodramatic, I mean literally, stark, raving mad. Proceed, I said, forcing a hearty grin. And don't apologize. I assure you I'm a good listener. After seeing to it that the fire was stoked and that I was comfortably ensconced in my overstuffed armchair, Howard began. The thing that sets my family apart from all other families, with one notable exception, is that we have been participants in a feud that dates back, he shrugged, who knows how long, to prehistory perhaps, certainly as far back as the Middle Ages, so long ago that no one remembers as the faintest inkling as to how the feud began. An argument over a woman the violation of some primitive taboo, an accidental slaying, an imagined social slight. A long, long time ago, the why of it ceased to matter. What matters is that the feud has, over the centuries, taken on a life of its own, with rules and codes of conduct independent of the laws of society. I won't bore you with the details, except to point out that it's because of the feud that I'm the last of my family. The feud has escalated to the point that we grosses are on the verge of extinction. And the other family? I butted in. The second half of this feud. Ah, hmm. The Wybrids. The hybrids are slightly better off as far as numbers are concerned. Two remain. Father and son, though. Not for long, if I have my way. What do you mean? I asked, shocked by the implications. Surely, abruptly, Howard rose from his seat. I may be rushing things, but look, do you mind terribly if I show you my parents' graves now? It'll make things clearer to you. I, I know it will. And so, moments later, we were groping our way down a flight of crude stone steps that led deep into the cellar. The sea captain who built this house back in the 1830s was a smuggler, I'm afraid, which accounts for these secret, dungeon-like passages. My dad and mom bought this place about 20 years ago. It's shortly after the war. They had the basement wired for electricity, even so. It's rather gloomy and damp and festooned with a century's growth of cobwebs. If Howard hadn't been in the lead, I would surely have lost my way. There were so many twists and turns, so many 
arched passageways that led seemingly nowhere. After an interminable length of time, we entered a large earthen-floored cavity. This used to be a wine cellar, Howard said. Now, oh, it's my parents' tomb. He reached to his right, found a switch, and flooded the room with light from an overhead bulb. I blinked. A musty odor tainted the air tinged with something more ominous than the redolence of old wine. I glanced around, expecting to encounter a pair of sarcophagi or, at the least, mounds of heaped earth. Nothing. The room appeared empty. I cast a questioning glance at my host. He nodded toward the far corner. I followed his gaze. There was something peculiar. The cement, apparently of more recent origin than that on the other walls, was also rougher. I moved in for a closer look. Gradually, the outlines, the silhouettes, came into focus. Embedded in the walls, they stood facing one another kitty corner. Two patterns, one slightly smaller than the other. Delineations, presumably, of what had once been human beings. My folks, Howard said. Mom and Dad. When I said nothing, he went on. What you see is the work of Wybrid Pere. When my parents fell in love and married, and eventually had me, they wanted no part of the feud, no part of the senseless animosities that had persisted for centuries. They wanted to lead normal lives. In hopes of escaping, they changed their name and sought out this secluded house to no avail. The elder Wybrid tracked them down. He caught them off guard. Two years ago. While I was away at school. He brought them down here. And attached them to the wall in that corner. Facing each other. So that they could witness one another's agony. He used meat hooks. Hooked them like slabs of beef. Then nailed their feet to wooden blocks so they couldn't thrash about. <sighs> he sewed the lips tight. <sighs> I haven't quite figured out why. So that they couldn't offer each other words of comfort. So that they couldn't curse him in their death throes. <clears throat> Howard shrugged. It's a mystery. I haven't quite figured out. Then, he walled them in, cemented over their bodies, all except their heads. He wanted them to breathe, you see, and each to be able to see what he was doing to the other. But before he walled them in, he fastened live rats to their bellies. The trapped and starving rats gnawed at my parents' entrails. They ate my parents alive. After a stunned moment, I said, And you came home and discovered this? Not exactly. Mr. Wybrid filmed the entire proceeding. He was kind enough to mail a copy of the film, complete with sound effects, to me at Boston University, along with a portable projector. I must have blanched, for Howard quickly added, Oh, don't worry. I won't ask you to view it. He turned to leave and I followed. 
I decided to leave my parents where they are. I completed their entombment by cementing over the remains of their faces. I keep their bodies there as a kind of memorial to them and to the feud. I take it you never notified the authorities. Why? Howard paused in his ascent up the stone steps. Turning, he cast a disturbed glance at me. It's too late in the feud, don't you think? After all these centuries to bring in the authorities. Hmm. I'll handle this my own way. And handle it he did. We spent the remainder of spring break like any two normal college kids on the lark. Hiking, boating, smoking cigars. And all the while, neither of us spoke of what Howard had shown me in his cellar. When we returned to Kenmore Square and Boston University, we continued our pact of silence. Howard had achieved his purpose, the staving off of madness. The knowledge that another shared his secret made it, somehow, more bearable. As for me, the image of those walled-in bodies and the manner of their deaths haunted my dreams for a while. But youth is resilient. In time, I was able to dismiss the matter from my mind. After graduation, Howard Gross and I went our separate ways, as no doubt we would have anyhow, had he never invited me to his home in Belfast. Over the years, through mutual acquaintances, I occasionally had word of him. Harvard Medical School, internship at a prestigious Boston hospital, a brilliant career as a neurologist, and later, hints of a scandal involving the occult a series of malpractice suits, and finally, obscurity. It was in the late 70s, some dozen or more years since I had last seen him, that I received a cryptic note in the mail. In need of a breath of sanity, please come to Belfast at once, for old time's sake. It was signed Howard Gross. I was living on Cape Cod at the time, a stint in Vietnam having scoured, I thought, all vestiges of squeamishness from my soul. I felt no compunctions about visiting my former roommate in his mansion cum mausoleum. Accordingly, I set aside my work as a freelance journalist and, a number of hours later, found myself reading the name on a rural mailbox in Belfast, Maine. Howard Gross, M.D. With his note, Howard had included a hand-drawn map of the area. Even without the map, I would have easily found my way through the conifers to the old sea captain's house on the bay. So emblazoned in my mind was that terrain from my impressionable youth. In contrast to the mansion itself, an impeccable repair and resplendent from a fresh coat of paint, with even the shrubbery now neatly trimmed, Howard, hair disheveled, clothing rumpled and unwashed, bore the slightly comical look of the stereotypical deranged scientist. He greeted me at the door, and without further preamble led the way into the library, where he sank into a chair and stared at me with what appeared to be a mixture of relief and apprehension. How goes the feud? I asked, when it became obvious that we were not to observe the usual amenities. Ah, the feud. That's why I asked you here. You're the only other person on earth safe, too. Who knows of the feud? The other two being Wybrids, father and son. You see, after all these years, I haven't forgotten. <laughs> he nodded. Wybrid Pere and Wybrid Feet. You surprise me. I would have thought the feud would have been resolved by now. One way. Or the other. Not quite resolved. 
Nearly so. In fact, I have something to show you. But first, where are my manners? You must be tired after you drove up from the Cape. There's an excellent bottle of Amontillado I've been saving for such an occasion. I never refused the wine. I was tired, but... More than that, I wanted to put off, for a while at least, whatever it was that Howard wanted to show me. Inevitably, however, the time came, and I was not surprised to find myself descending once again the steep stone steps that led to the depths of the cellar. The horror I found there surpassed my expectations. As before, Howard led the way into the converted wine cellar, where, entombed alive, his mother and father had each died a heinous death. As we entered the room, my gaze naturally fell in their direction, and I saw that in that particular corner, nothing had changed. The outlines of their bodies were clearly discernible beneath the cement. It was the wall to the left that had been altered. At first, I didn't comprehend what it was I saw. A grotesque sculpture or three-dimensional painting. A prop left over from some grand guignol or carnival sideshow. Even when I detected the slow pulsation, I still didn't fully comprehend. It was only when my ears picked up the faintest susurration as of labored breathing, that I had an inkling of the manner in which Howard Gross had avenged the murder of his parents. Let me introduce you to Mr. Wybrid, Howard said. He went over to the thing on the wall. There followed a low, keening sound, as of someone in great pain. Lips, pale, swollen, bloodless, like fat grub worms unearthed beneath a rotting log, writhed on the wall, and I saw indentations that were eyes. Eyes which, I swear, the dripping tears of discolored pus beseeched me. He's not feeling well today, I'm afraid. Howard! In the name of God, I grafted him to the wool, Howard said, as he stood and admired his handiwork. I'm an accomplished surgeon, you know, though I must confess it required more than science to achieve this. Something the ignorant might term black magic, though the line between science and the occult is a tenuous one at best. In any event, there you have it. He's now part of the house. Has been for the last eighteen months. Shall be for a very long time to come. As I stumbled up the stairway in my frantic haste to escape, Howard shouted after me. There remains now only the problem of Wybrid the Younger. Once I've dealt with him, the feud will at long last be over. And indeed, the feud has ended, though not, I fear, the way Howard might have wished. It was only last year that I received a brief message on my answering machine, in a voice I didn't recognize. Come to Belfast. It was not Howard, but a slightly younger man who answered the door on my third visit to the former captain's house. So kind of you to come, he said, even before I had a chance to introduce myself. Dr. Gross has told me all about you. I'm Joseph Wybrid, by the way. I believe you met my father once, many years ago. Dad has since passed on. Dr. Gross still lives here, though. Well, <laughs> he chuckled. Lives isn't quite the word to describe his 
mode of existence. Come to the basement. See for yourself the manner in which he passes his days. 